Gig Gab, episode 343 for Monday, April 25th, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. Back in Napomo, California, it's Paul That's Kent. That's right. That's yeah. right. I'm back. Yeah. So tell tell us you 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 I well, I saw a video of you in in Ireland entertaining in a club or in a pub, I should say. The, what how did that happen? <laughs> Um, so the, this trip that my wife and I had planned that we'd put off a couple times, you know, was COVID affected and sure. everything like that finally came together and we did two amazing weeks touring around Ireland and we went all around the country. I mean, r- pretty much the whole ring of the country hmm. and, uh, it was great. It's beautiful. Everything they say about how welcoming and funny and charming the people of Ireland are is absolutely correct. Everywhere we went, we were we were welcomed and and uh, engaged in great conversations, and there was music everywhere, man. It is, huh. I mean, I couldn't really run any parallels to anything in the United States like this. I mean, the number of places that say live music here, and again, it starts usually with a basis of traditional Irish music. Okay, okay. Um, but the number of places that you know are promoting live music as part of what they do was fantastic. And the other thing that struck me was. Uh, I think we, out of 14 nights, we saw live music probably seven or eight nights. Um, That's awesome. It starts off with traditional Irish music, which is, you know, in the pub scene is, is um, you know, a bunch of people in the corner, usually not amplified. Um, and it's usually a guitar player, maybe a banjo or a mandolin player, often a violin fiddle player, yep. uh, an accordion player, Sometimes someone on something like spoons and 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 a washboard or something like that, yeah. and it and they're playing you know Irish traditional music. I was struck, wide eyed, by how all ages were are into it. Kids are into it, uh, and again, you know, all ages. Kids, you know, younger from, people from, from eight to workouts, eighty, huh? Yeah, eight to eighty, and um, there's an appreciation of it. Certain songs will get all ages singing along, you know, uh, <clears throat> certainly just about everything they do, they get applause at the end of the show. I don't know. I didn't even ask the question. I don't know if they're paid or they just get free beers in these types of scenes. Uh, most of them did not have a tip jar out either. So it is literally a communal experience yeah. that people are taking part in and it was really fantastic. But again, I was trying to think where in the U.S., would you see that type of, you know, total buy-in to a musical experience? Uh, a, 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 you know, you yeah. said maybe New or- maybe New Orleans, although I don't know, you know, would someone, would people under 25 revel in seeing, you know, a, a jazz band, a New Orleans jazz band? You know, I know that they'll, they'll hop into a parade or something like that, but I don't know. I don't know if, if from a listening and sing-along experience, I couldn't really compare it to anything that really got all ages involved. Uh, and it was wonderful, fantastic. And anyway, that's so awesome. the story about how, yeah, the story about how I got to play the pub was um, we went into a pub in Dublin. Okay. We happened to get seats at the end of the bar that was right near where the musicians were coming. And we didn't even know that there was going to be live music that night. And um, a, an older gentleman was standing right next to me. And as happened many times in this trip, we struck up a little conversation. Sure. And he shared that he that there was going to be, a, they call them sessions, there was going to be a session that night. And he was there to sing a few songs. And my wife leans over and goes, oh, my husband's a musician. And he goes, oh, well, you'll have to play. And I was like, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the, you know, the, the instrumental musician showed up. No one was really in charge. You know, they just, someone just starts a song. The other one's going to join in. Okay. Uh, one guy was, was, was playing a couple Bob Dylan songs. Um, a lot of older traditional stuff. Um, and then Jimmy, the man who I was standing next to, and he was clearly, he was a, he was kind of a senior statesman in the scene and I got everybody kind of got quiet and they kind of deferred to him. And he just did, you know, an acapella song. 
That was fantastic. Although he did um, uh, poems, prayers, prayers, and promises by by John Denver, <laughs> and it was and it went over, and you know, which actually sounded almost like an Irish poem. But yeah, um, I can see anyway, that. Anyway, they they said, "Paul, you're up," and they went in, and I played. The first song I did was uh, was Folsom Prison Blues by Johnny Cash, and yeah. the whole bar was into it, and you know it was really fun, and uh, went over great. So the, as I handed the guy his guitar back, he goes, "Oh, you're going to be back, you know, hang out." And so I, I next one I did, I said, "Is it cool to do a Van Morrison song here in Dublin?" He goes, "Oh yeah." And so we did Brown Eyed Girl, and everybody sang along with that. Ah, it was great. that's great. Yeah. And then my last one was a Springsteen song, and you know Springsteen is loved in in Ireland, and so we had everybody sing along to Hungry Heart. Yeah. And I made, you know, uh, it was just a thrill. It was just a cool experience to just sit in, see how people reacted to what I do and, uh, you know, be a part of what they do. Yeah. And it was just great. That's yeah. amazing. So anyway, That's, I'm glad that yay, worked out. Ireland. Yeah. I'm glad your wife spoke yeah. up. That's good. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. That's great, man. That's good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Fun. Cool. Yeah. I've played, uh, I think I've played every weekend that since we have done this the last time, it's been 20 days. It was April 5th. Amazing. The last time we released an episode. Yeah. I, uh, we did, we had our bitter pill, uh, expand our carbon footprint tour. We played the Claremont opera house over in Claremont, New Hampshire. And then the, uh, we played the, the, the other stone church, uh, over in Brattleboro, Vermont. I saw the pictures of that. That place, it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, great. and it, it sounded great. It It is an old stone church uh, and probably would have sounded awful. The engineers said it did sound awful, but they put up so much sound baffling in all the right places. And they- So they, the pure stone would have made it an echo chamber, right? Oh like yeah, it would have been a nightmare. All over the place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they put up, all these baffles that until you knew to look for them, they just blended right in. But as soon as, you know, I knew to look for them, it was like, oh my God, they're everywhere. And then it was like, wait, wait, they're really everywhere. And he's like, yeah, it's like, that's why it sounds so good in here. And it really did. It was a, a wonderful stage, a wonderful place. It was a so good, cool. a good bill to play. But yeah, we joked, we called it our, uh, we played the Western shore of New Hampshire because, you know, the Connecticut river splits New Hampshire and Vermont over there. So mm -hmm. it was, yeah, we had fun with that. But um, my, you know, I had that surgery on my left hand or on my left arm, I should say I, my dexterity, my confidence with my left hand. I, I did not know how bad things had gotten until I had this problem solved. Like it, it, this has definitely been at least a five year problem for me. And mm. uh, yeah, so, so, and it's, I mean, it's, it's amazing how quickly I just like my left hand raced back. I mean, I've been making sure to play every day and and work on some, you know, some dexterity stuff, but where I'm finding the difference is sure. If I'm playing like, you know, intricate stuff, it's way easier. My, my, my fingers, my, especially the, the ring finger, and the pinky finger, which are sort of control the, the bounce of the stick and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I did not realize that those had basically been doing nothing for the last, you know, several years. Uh, I'd compensated for it, but you know, it's easier when they, when they do the things they're supposed to do. But, um, where I'm finding it is my time is it, like, I just have a lot more confidence in my time now that, than I yeah. have, it, which is in, not, not an expected result of this, but it makes sense. Right. You know, I'm not, I'm not compensating for something weird going on in my hand. And, uh, so it's like grooves are better. Things sit in the pocket better. Uh, it's, it's, it's great. So, uh, last week on Wednesday, I decided to be, I think proactive and have a few of these things that are in key were in key locations on my right arm removed. Uh, I'll give it a few more days before I know whether it was truly proactive or if in fact this has been causing me problems on my right arm too. Uh, mm -hmm. but I, but I had those taken out on Wednesday and then we had a gig Last night, today's Monday, so we had this gig Sunday night. It was a benefit for Ukraine. It was a, like six bands, I think, played, each each doing a 45-minute set. And I, I knew going into this, like, Saturday, and I'd been playing every day, including I had the surgery Wednesday. That night I actually played for about two hours, and it, it's it's been fine. But as things had started to heal, I had noticed that, like, if I was playing, I, I might – um, my, like things would, one of them was like on the bottom. Actually, there were, it was one big, I thought it was one big one, but there were two next to each other. 
And so it kind of like where that's coming back together, it, my arm, my skin kind of jiggles around. So I figured oh, I should wrap my arm before I play the gig. So I, I, I did that. But I had to kind of deal with that. So I knew, okay, I'm going to be going in. Well, also then yesterday morning, I woke up with some of the worst food poisoning I've ever had in my life. Mm. And, uh, and it was touch and go as to whether or not I would play the gig. But I got to a point where it was like, I think, I, I, I think I'm safe to leave the house for a couple of hours. <laughs> and, uh, and thankfully, we were you know on a shared back line and all that. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, lugging drums up yep. into the, the club and all that good stuff. And the gig went fine. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was dicey, but it worked out. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, I, it, it, things, things were not better, but I made it, you know, I made it through dry. Let's go, let's call it. Let's go with that. Right. There were no, but you incidents. know, you had, you taking care of this, you know, surgical thing, you know, it, it is a reminder. And I, you know, certainly I've been through many things, Healthy matters quite a bit. Like oh, yeah. doing it, like if you want to do this, right? Yeah. A perspective, and, and again, I know like a lot of cover band artists are, are getting older or are older. Um, it is a physical endeavor is one yes. thing. And if you really want to be honest about it, being able to do the best you can requires you being in good Good, good shape. Good condition. Say, well, yeah. good shape is, you know, a relative thing. I, I just mean like all the things that you can take care of. Yes. I don't think everybody who's a musician needs to hit the gym, you know, seven days a week and that type of thing. Sure. Unless that's what you want to do. But the healthier you are, the better you can deliver the goods. Absolutely. And that is the goal, right? I mean, yep. you know, it, it, it is similar to me like this conversation about, about how, you know, what does it matter? I address all these types of things. It all matters. You know, it, yeah. that's the thing. It all matters. If we can agree that playing music is more than just moving your hands or moving your mouth, it is a physical endeavor. It is a visual medium, you know, yeah. all these types There's of all things. Those you things. Really, yeah. you have to be honest about what you're doing if you want to be a performing musician. Yeah, no, it's true. And and like I said, I, I am stoked that I was able to get this dealt with and I'm, I'm stoked that my, my, in, my, it, gastrointestinal system uh, cooperated last night for the gig. Cause it was, it was, it was good. You know, it was good to do. It was an interesting gig. Um, you know, with the shared back line, we, we started our set eight minutes after the band before us finished. Like that's how quick our changeover was able to be. Um, we had a great house engineer at the press room, this guy, Mike Marchand, who I've worked with many, many times. He's, he's a consummate professional, knows exactly what he's doing. Super easy to work with, uh, and, and really knows his stuff and he can make things work. But you know, the other band got off stage quickly. We got on stage quickly. It, because of the quick changeover, I opted not to ask if it was possible to get a feed for my in-ears. Mm -hmm. So it meant, I think the last gig I played without ears was also a shared band, you know, a, a multi-band bill, uh, shared back line uh, with Bitter Pill at uh, somewhere in Dover, New Hampshire. I can't remember which, maybe it was the Brick House in Dover. Uh, I think it was. And so that would have been three and a half years ago or something like that. I had forgotten how loud a monitor wedge needs to be in order to be able to hear it effectively over a snare drum and a hi-hat. So that was like, I, in retrospect, I probably should have asked Mike if he could have given me a feed. It, I mean, it probably would have been just as easy as taking the cable out of the back of the, the wedge and plugging it into my <laughs> headphone amp, right? I mean, it would have been mm -hmm. doable. But we were look, I was looking to be efficient. It was a 45-minute set. It, you know, I figured, well, it's not a big deal. And it was fine, you, you know, and he got my mix where I needed it to be. We, we actually tweaked it during the set uh, because that's how things kind of went. But it, it all could happen with nonverbal cues, and so it didn't become part of the show, which was good. But um, it, it, it reminded me of, well, A, how important and how much I, I love my in-ears. <laughs> yep. But, you know, we've been having this conversation in Fling because the whole band has now moved to in-ears and the whole band has moved to an ampless scenario. But we haven't played too many gigs this way. In fact, we have played exactly one gig this way. And I'm curious to see how this evolves with Fling. I started a thread in our Facebook group, our GigGab Facebook group, about how people are dealing with this. Because I started thinking, okay, 
you know, let's assume it's a gig where we're doing our own sound, right? Because a multi-band gig on, you know, a shared backline starts to get even more interesting with, with this. But, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's a gig where we're doing our own sound. If we set up in, in the traditional way of having drums, you know, up center and then the rest of the band sort of, you know, down uh, across the, the downstage, won't the people in the front only hear drums like there because there are the only sounds for mm -hmm. instruments are happening coming out of the, you know, the mains. Mm -hmm. There's no monitors on stage to, to even fill in the sound that way. Right. You, you know, everybody's on ears. There's presumably mains left and right, uh, you know, wide stage. And so I started thinking about like, well, isn't this going to be a major issue for for a band and and I asked and people said yeah like it is sometimes what they'll do is is set up a monitor wedge and face it outward at a lower volume to kind of be a center fill channel if you will uh or even just set up monitors on stage to to add you know that sort of sound to fill that in another person suggested well it, you know and they they knew that we had done this at times with fling where I would set up my drums on stage left kind of facing sideways they're like if you do that that way your drums are near a speaker. And so that becomes less of a problem. You don't have the drums, you know, coming from a different spot than the rest of the sound. I thought, okay, that's interesting, you know. And and so it, it's just been, I'd be curious to hear what everybody, anybody out there has done in this regard, because I know we're going to run into some of this and have to solve for it. And I'd love to take advantage of uh, lessons that others have learned, although I know we will be learning them as we start gigging out. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, feedback at gigabpodcast.com, folks. But, um, but, you know, and then I started thinking after the gig last night, like on, on a shared band bill, last night it would have worked out fine if people were using just modelers, you know, for their, their stuff. I think both, I know both banjo and ukulele went direct into the board. So that's effectively the same as using a modeler. You, you know, it's, it's, it's going in and you're just getting signal out of the, the monitor wedges and the mains. But if the whole band is expecting, like I could have asked yesterday to be on in ears, and Mike probably would have said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah just take the feet out of there and and deal with it." But if the whole band starts asking that question, you know, at what point is the front of house engineer for a you know multi band bill where efficiency rules the day? At what point are they going to say, "All right, it's over. Like, just deal with the wedges, guys." <laughs> it's it's a forty five minute set, right? Like. It's a little bit different when you've got one guy and, and I've learned, right. I've been doing this almost 20 years with in-ears. I, I know how to be as headache free as possible for the, for the front of house engineer. I've, mm -hmm. I've, you know, I've learned, I asked two questions. What is the Wi-Fi password and which submix am I? That's it. Right. If I endear myself to the sound person over the next you know, 20 minutes while we're getting everything set up, you know, assuming it's not a quick changeover or something, then I might ask, Hey, by the way, you know, uh, which effects channels have the reverb in it so I can maybe sweeten up my mix or something. But these are, you know, non-essential questions that I will only ask if I feel if I, you know, if I'm reading the room and it feels like it's an okay question to ask and I'm not, right, right. you know, not being a pain in the ass, but um, it's going to, it, it, you know, it's going to be interesting as, as, as fling heads down this path, because those guys are going to have to learn how to negotiate that. I mean, I can coach them a little bit, but you know, it's one of those things you just got to do it a few times. In fact, it seems to me like many I, I know more bands that are kind of going to that model. And I yeah. just wonder if there's a, just kind of a watershed moment in, it, in it, stage it, sound coming where it's more going to be the norm than it is going to be the exception. I, I think you're right. I, it, you know, there was to my knowledge, no one yesterday at, at this at that particular gig used in ears, which it seemed strange to me, but it's entirely possible that every other person that would have made exactly the same decision I did, like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'll deal with this for today. It's fine. It, it, you know, cause, because it was a quick changeover and all that stuff, but you're right. At some point it like, like monitor wedges are now, in ears will become the norm or will have become the norm. I don't think we're there yet, but you might be right, Paul. We might be really close to that. Yeah. Seems like more bands are going that way. It's, it's, it's economical. You can play in more places. Yeah. You know, it, there's just, it seems, and again, now 
that I am getting to the place where I am comfortable with it. I can see, and I've always kind of intellectually known. Oh yeah, it's you know, different. This is good. Right. right I right, just right. didn't experience it the way every, everybody else did, and you know, seems like I'm on the path to that now. But yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting though that I never thought about. You know, what is the implication for the people down front if you're not pushing any air? You know, yeah, it's a drum concert. It's a drum concert for those people in the middle. Yeah, yeah. I know. As soon as I. It, 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 one gig came up a place that I've played with bitter pill a couple of times, this place flight coffee, uh, which is a great room. We've always had great shows there and, and fling has booked the date there in August. And I just pointed out to the guys, I'm like, Hey, you know, every time I've played there, they have enough to put three vocals in their PA. Mm. It's, it's, it's an anomaly at this place where they do your sound for you, but it's limited what they do. It's a small room, so you definitely don't need to mic like guitars and things like you certainly don't need to mic drums or anything like that. So putting vocals in the PA is is the right thing in this. But usually those kinds of rooms aren't doing your sound for you, right? You, you know, right. those kinds of places, you're just on your own. Right. And, I, and so I said to these guys, I'm like, you know, if we play there – my experience thus far, and of course things change and the question hasn't really been asked sort of, you know, in the past, but my experience, my expectation is we may have to be the ones creating our own sounds, you know, so it would mean bringing a speaker to plug your modelers into, and it could just be one speaker. Like, I, you know, the room's small enough that ma that might work out. I don't know, but right. you know, it was like, they were like, Oh, they've got a 16 channel board. We could probably just plug everything into that. I'm like, it might not be that simple. You know, <laughs> like you got to read the room a little bit. And, and so I'm, I'm in, I'm curious to see how those negotiations go as we start playing, especially multi-band bills and things like that. Like at what point, like you said, the watershed moment where the mod, like, I think we're, we're to the point where the modeler thing is fairly common, but yeah. again, there's going to be some places where you got to bring your own speaker, you know, to make your, yeah. to make noise. And, and yeah, the in-ear thing is interesting. Like, I don't know how drummers deal with it at, at this flight coffee place, for example, because they have, I think just one monitor wedge up front. So like if a drummer's not using in-ears, how do they hear that? Mm -hmm. I, like, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know how other people solve this problem. Well, I know so. in smaller places, me using that, um, that Bose tower yeah. is, is everything, you know, totally fine, totally easy. You know, have you used that um, full band or just, a, a, you know, the, three, the acoustic thing? Band, yeah. Okay. You have used three, it like yeah. with drums. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, you place it behind and, yep. you know, everybody can hear and, and, uh, you know, you keep things simple. So, you know, the, in all things that in life, the pendulum sense. swings back and forth between, you know, two points, yeah. complex and simple being the most obvious ones. And, and, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think uh, music and places where you can play music and, you know, this big swing towards acoustic setups and smaller venues for bands and, you know, less emphasis on dance venues. And, yeah. you know, it, it, the, the world is changing in many ways and the products to support those types of things. I guess, you know, what, what is the last part of the in-ear component, you know, Tell me again, remind me, how did Dan Meblum describe how they kind of walk in with their own in-ear rig and they're ready to go? Well, they walk in with their entire rig, right? So they bring their, the, the, the same mixer to every gig. Everybody plugs into the same channel they always do. And they use split tails. So, you know, they, they use, they mix their own ears on stage using their own mixer, no matter what. And mm -hmm. if there's front of house sound that's that uses a different mixer, that's where those split tails come in and the front of house engineer can plug their snake in and go whatever order they want. So, you know, if Dan's setup is, you know, kick snare, overhead, overhead, bass, guitar, whatever, and the engineer at the venue wants vocals in the first four channels, we'll just plug into those, grab whatever you want. But that, that you know, they, it's essentially just, you know, a, a splitter on the, in, the XLR yeah. inputs so that the the band can plug in and use theirs and the the front of house person can plug in and use theirs and then it's it's easy for them yeah. that that i mean certainly that could work it, that would be the most overkill i could possibly imagine for a place like a flight coffee you, you know where it's like yeah. are we going to but you know i'm thinking that's my feeling today and it's because fling has done exactly one gig with 
uh, you know, with, with modelers and in-ears, if we had done two years worth of gigs this way, it'd be like, oh, well, we'll just bring our thing in and we'll feed them the three vocals that they want. And then we'll run a sub mix so that the instruments that need to happen on stage can just happen. And we'll run those into a little speaker we have on stage and everything's going to be fine. It might really be the best way to do it. Now that we're having this conversation, it seems like know, overkill, but maybe it's yeah. not, maybe it's simple. Yeah. So again, in the search for simple, um, do you know of a product that is just, you know, usually what you have is that you have to bring actually a physical mixer and then there's, you know, the mixer can also be controlled by an iPad. Sure. Do you know of any products where literally all the smarts are a box and the only way to access the faders are through an iPad app? Yeah, that's what we're using. The, the, oh. the Mackie, the DL 32 S and the DL 32 R are that way. There, there is no iPad. You know, there's no, there's, there's no interface on the box. It, it looks like a stage box, right? It happens to have all the smarts in it and, and a Wi-Fi router, albeit a limited one at that, uh, you know, <laughs> definitely travel with your own, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. that you can use separately, but yeah, no, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's just, you know, it's got. 32 inputs and, and eight or 10 outputs and that's it. That's all you get. Got it. Yeah. So that's exactly it. Yeah. And so again, I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at this thing cause it's, it's sitting here in my studio. It's like, maybe that is the right answer for fling. We just do that and we dedicate a, you know, we decide what should go to the main mix and, you know, so we don't put drums in the main mix that day, but we put, uh, you know, not vocals, right? We turn the, the volume down on vocals because they're going to have those coming out their mains or, right. I don't, you know, like maybe that is the best way to do it. And that way everybody's in-ears are already wired up. Everything's there. And yeah, we're going to have to bring our own cables because I know that Flight Coffee only had like three XLR cables last time I was there. So fine. But, you know, we all wire in and, and it's done. Maybe that's the simplest way. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds massively overkill. But if we're... If we're to the point where that's what we're used to and that's what we're most efficient getting set up with, then that's probably the right way to go. Just, yeah, just rock and roll and, and bring, you know, Mike Scott, uh, Mike, uh, guitar player in Fling, has, he's actually got a couple of those, the EV towers, essentially like your Bose tower, you know, and so maybe he mm -hmm. brings brings one of those and that's what the guitars and, and keys come out of and everything's, everybody's happy. I You know. I mean, that's the answer. Simple is good. Yeah, it's but it seems it, like we're bringing a massive amount of complexity in to keep it simple. But again, yeah. if we've already sort of addressed the complexity and all anybody has to do is just plug in the cables and it's done, well, then that is simple, right? So, yep. yep. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for uh, you know <laughs> the 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 uh, letting me talk this out because that's actually really helpful. Seems crazy, but that's the answer. I think anyway, you, you saw an interesting thing, a comment by our friend, uh, Adam over at cover band confidential. Yes, I did. And, and I, I think we should back up a little bit. There's been this meme type thing flying around that this woman wrote kind of an open letter to venues about yeah. how to treat musicians. And, uh, you and I both saw it and, um, you know, largely, I've seen a lot of like music fans saying, oh, this is gold. This is, yes, this is what needs to be said. And a lot of musicians saying, yes. This, Can you this, summarize this, what, what the gist but, of it was just for people who yeah. haven't seen it? Yeah. The basic thing was, you know, treat musicians well. And, you know, it's a partnership and, you know, and, uh, you know, we're in this together, but treat us well, you know, yeah. pay us well. Yeah. And, don't, and actually a, a not subtle subtext is stop doing business with the people who are not professional. Right. That actually probably is stop doing business with 50% of the message. The, the, the message to venues is stop doing business with unprofessional musicians just because they're cheap. Right. Got Thank it. You. Okay. That's it. Yep. Great. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of going around and, you know, it, it's one of the main themes that you see from all the resources that musicians can look for is like, all the time. you know, gee, why, are, why is the pay scale the same as it was 50 years ago? Why, 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 why? Yep. Uh, you know, should we be able to, it's just for fun. You know, it's your problem if you don't like that I'm, you know, a, a weekend warrior and, and, uh, and I'm going to, you know, play for nothing. You know, that's your problem, not my problem. And, you know, it, it's kind of the eternal, eternal quest you know for truth <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a musician right yeah right so anyway uh 
our friend Adam Johnson over at Cover Band Confidential. Adam's doing he's doing really good work. I mean, they have a, a podcast similar to what we we do. They cover different topics. Adam's a, and Dan are both really good musicians and have a lot to add to the conversation. Adam, in addition, does a video series where he does his own commentary on some other things. And um, there, he been made a comment about you know when he plays events about about that the you know a you know pay us you know fair or you know or or I won't do the gig and Adam is much more I will or will I will choose whether I do or do a gig whether the gig is to the standards of yeah. quality that I expect for myself which you know put that in we need to talk about that but you know kind of put that on the side for now and then he just made a kind of an off comment about you know that the venues should should provide a meal if he's going to be there before the doors open and he needs to be there, you know, a particularly long time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, you don't deserve a meal. That's, you know, you're lucky to have a gig. And he's, and he's like, nope, he said, listen. And this is the quote that caught my eye. He said, listen, I'm the entertainment, not the help. Stop looking at me as your employee. That's not the, that's not what's going on here. And I thought that was really remarkable and insightful. And, you know, in a lot of ways, when you're a musician, the value that you see for yourself is the reality that you're going to create for yourself. Well, that's true in life in general. Yes, that's for right. sure. For sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to. But right. I love that line. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm the entertainment, not the help. There is a difference. So, you know, the people who say, who say, you know, I'm, I'm just happy to have the gig. That is something that needs to be held up to the light, man, because, you know, there are gigs you know, it is hard and you do have to compete for gigs and really good gigs are, you know, it's a, it's a pyramid. You know, you can play for free in a lot of places. Really good gigs that pay well are nice places. They treat you well. There's fewer of those, you know, at the top of the pyramid. Right. But a large part of whether you're going to get those gigs, if you've done the other stuff, you've got a good band, you're well rehearsed, you know, you, you've, got a, you've got a good show. You, you know, you've got your technical stuff taken care of by bringing your Mackie mixer in. <laughs> you know, you've got, <laughs> you know, if you've got all the other stuff done, why not you for the top of the pyramid? And part of it is whether you th believe that you deserve to be at the top of the pyramid. Yeah. And I, that's kind of what, what Adam's comment to me spoke. And I, I know you had a lot of opinions about that one open letter thing. Um, maybe we can talk about that as well. But I just wanted to, you know, give a, a, a tip of the hat to Adam because that kind of crystallize the right way to think about things if you want good gigs you need to think of yourself as worthy of good gigs and well, that, that i agree with a hundred percent this idea i am the entertainment not the help I, like it, it's it's a good soundbite and i i agree with it to a to a degree but i i like it's and i and i, and I suppose the nuances of the definition of or the difference in definition of entertainment for help versus help comes up here. If it's should you get a meal if you're there for, you know, eight hours? Well, and they're serving meals. You know, there's some places that don't serve meals. And so, OK, well, that's different. You, you know, like what are they are they supposed to go and cater you a meal just because you're the artist? And maybe the answer is yes. And maybe the answer is no. Uh, yeah. but it, you know, it, but the the idea that. It's okay to expect to be treated well. I firmly agree with, but I also think like, I mean, you've had employees throughout your career. I have employees. Like I think everybody deserves to be treated well, whether they're entertainment or help or both. Right. You, you know, so th there's, there's some line, at, for example, you know, playing weddings um, at, especially, you know, I'm reminded of this place near us called Wentworth by the sea, which is, you know, I've, I've mentioned it a couple of times before on the show. I know, it's super old New England money kind of stuffy venue kind of thing. And there the bands are very much uh, treated like the help. We get a meal. So perhaps it hits Adam's definition of of being treated well. I wouldn't ever say we're treated poorly there, but we are very much treated like, oh, you can't walk out in, in amongst where the the patrons are. You have to navigate your way through the place, you know, through the kitchens and the, you know, the back channel to get from like the green room to the stage. You know, you you can't be where the guests are. And that's just that's not a a policy of the people booking the the band or booking the gig. Mm -hmm. It's the policy of the venue. 
Right. Like, Interesting. yeah. So, but, but again, I, 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 but they've, ne- we've never been treated poorly there. We've always been treated quite well, but you are treated the same as the rest of the help, right? You know, the, the guests and the not guests are, are separated. Now, once we're on stage, we get to be on stage and we get to perform and do our thing. Like, that's why we're there. It's not like they tell us, oh, you know, don't make the show. I mean, you're not at a wedding. You're not supposed to make the show about you anyway. But, you know, they're not telling us to alter our performance because they want to treat us like the help or any, you know, it's like we're allowed to be there and perform. But um, but we are very much treated like the help. But I don't see that as a problem. But again, a, you know, Adam's definition may may work just fine for that kind of scenario. I think you're a little bit deconstructing this to a, to too great a degree. We've I met, that, right? Like, you know me. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think that the philosophical, you know, gestalt of this yeah. is is there is a difference between the entertainment. And again, this is not a knock on whatever the help might be, whether it's a server or, sure. or a janitor or anything. It's not a knock about that. It's simply saying, you know, there's also a difference between, you know, an attorney and and a paralegal, right? I mean, I mean you know, there's different levels of of, uh, of qualifications for any tasks that are going to happen. And the problem is, is I think the problem is, is there's just too much um, there's just too much tolerance. And I guess too much, too much tolerance and participation from those who want to say that they are working musicians yeah. for um, for lowest common denominator treatment. And again, I'm trying to be judicious about it because you know, like in most things, it's, there's not black and white. And you're no, right. it's you know, all nuanced. Your venue, your yeah. band chooses to work that room. Yeah, uh, right. So I would say if if it, it, I, I'm not 100 percent in Adam's head, but I would say like. You get asked to do a wedding at, at, a, at a room like that. You say, well, here's my writer and, you know, we require a meal and we you know require this. And whether you do or do not require bar privileges or all those types of things. And then they come back and say, we can do this. We can do that. We can do that. And you either agree or you don't agree. And yeah. if your standards are, I don't agree unless all things on my writer, you may work less and you may be happy with that. Right. Yeah. But, there's nothing wrong but, with it being knowing your value and stating your value. Now, obviously – there are nuances to that too. You can be a jackass about it or you can be, you know, kind about it and and professional about it and get and continue to get work, right? So, uh, yeah, no, I I totally agree with that. There's nothing wrong with asking for all kinds of things. And I will tell you this, it's way easier if you put these kinds of things in your, you know, your writer, your advance, what, whatever it is that you're doing, like, you know, we just had a conversation about in ears and modelers, an easy way to state your expectations is to send an advance to the venue. Like, here's our stage plot. Here's what we need. Here's what we use. Here's what we expect from you. Now, I will tell you, and anybody that's ever sent an advanced stage plot to a venue will tell you, oftentimes they'll say, hey, uh, you know, our gear doesn't work with this. Can we do X, Y, or Z instead? And oftentimes you're like, yeah, that sounds great. But you've had the conversation and you've created the conversation by sending this to them. And the same thing can happen in your contract with, you know, we, and, and so we're going to be there for eight hours. We expect a meal here. We expect that here's how the set will flow. We will have a break there. All of those things. Again, everything in life is a negotiation, right? But you, you paved the foundation for that negotiation yeah. by just sending that along as opposed to asking piecemeal. Hey, can we get a meal? Hey, we need to make sure we talk about our break. Hey, we need to like that because that starts to become disrespectful uh, and, and, you don't and have tedious because you don't have your act together. Right. And, but you can skip that tedium by just saying, here's all the things and just present it. Don't, and, and you know, there's a, there's a thing in sales that we talk about called the silent close, Right. Where he, who you know, the, 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 the follow up to that is he who speaks next loses. Right. So mm. you state your, your price, your terms, your conditions, and then you stop talking. Right. And let the other person digest what you said and respond. And, and it doesn't, I, I don't necessarily like the, he who speaks next loses concept because it, it, it implies that this is a, you know, zero sum game. I always like to look at things as non zero sum games where everybody actually gets more value out of it when it, when it all works the way it's supposed to. So I don't necessarily like that, but the silent close 
can be a helpful thing and, and you can do it very comfortably by having all of these things written down. Like you said, having your act together. So here's our things. And then they'll look at that and say, okay, we can do this. Look, we're not going to be able to feed you the lobster tails that you have on here, but you know, does a pizza sound good? And you're like, yeah, pizza sounds great. You know, so it can work out just fine. Um, but it, yeah, having it together in a, in a packaged way makes life easier. And it, you know, it doesn't need to be some printed piece of paper. It doesn't even need to be a PDF. It could just be a thing that you paste into your emails when you're going back and forth on this. Here's, you know, here's what we need to make the evening work and, and they'll see it and then either agree or, or you negotiate and that's okay. Like yep. it's all about making it work together, it, you know, and hopefully, like I said, no one has to quote unquote lose that it, it all works out. Um, but yeah, having your act together, knowing what you want, it, it, to Adam's point, treating yourself like you have value and you are bringing value changes that whole conversation. Not the, hey, would it be okay if, if, if maybe you, you know, got us some nachos or whatever? Like, no. Like, and we, you yeah. know. We agreed. Here's we, it is. We, we, there's know, a meal. We, we, this yeah. is already done. It's yeah. already done. Yeah. Okay, and exactly. again, this has been a learning process for me because I started out with our contracts and riders. It was much more technical, like how big, how wide the stage sure. has to be or making sure there was power there. Yeah. But, you know, you learn as it goes along. Ours added, like, when we're playing outdoor gigs, will they provide, um, we ask for covering, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not in direct sun. Uh, yes, we can cover ourselves, but I would rather them do it. So we'll ask them to do it first. But I, again, we're, we're, we're drilling down. No, but that's like, those are important things. It, it, they it, are all absolutely important things, but yeah. I just think more the philosophical approach that we are the entertainment that is, that is a, that is really helpful. Yeah. Um, that we are being the, and, and again, this isn't a knock on the help. This is more about what does it mean that we are the entertainment? What is our negotiating power that we are the entertainment? What are, right. you know, what are we entitled to? What are we willing to put up with? You know, those are all the types of kind of philosophical questions that I think are really helpful to, to and again, you put it, you know, the easiest way is, you know, in an engagement, you put it in, you put it in writing some kind, right. yeah. you negotiate it. I, I will say, it's funny to me that you say that, you know, you start, I, I can't tell you like the number of like advanced things that we've sent along that literally don't get looked at. Oh no. So we have a, yeah. Right. You know, right. especially club dates. Right. You know, like like casuals and you know private things and corporate things. Usually there's a person whose job it is to execute the contract and they, you know, will get you your meals and, you know, con communicate with you in some way. But I, you know, so many club dates, they ask for a stage plot or something like that. And you walk in and you you're know, like, so what do we got? With, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, when they ask that question, you know, Van Halen used to have to put the brown M&Ms thing in their writers so that that was their litmus test. Right. Remove the brown right. M&Ms. And that way they would know if somebody read this, the, the particulars or didn't. I don't even think you need to go that far. You know, you show up and they're like, so what do we, what do we got here? What do you need? Like, oh, they don't know anything. Okay. We're starting yeah. to be at the beginning, everybody. And you know, like right out of the gate. Yeah. The, I'm finding more and more, not everywhere, but more and more we show up and, and people are like, you know, a good one for me at, at bitter pill gigs, especially is if somebody comes up and says, here's the feed for your in-ears or Here's the cable, the mic cable for your cajon, because I, I I play that pitch slap for a few tunes, you know, in each set. And if they say that, then either one of those things, then we know they've read mm -hmm. the the stage plot. Like, because those are atypical things. You know, you don't go up to most drummers and say, here's the mic cable for your cajon, you know. Um, it used to be, you know, would they give me a, uh, would they have a cable for my vocal mic, right? Which it, not every drummer sings. And so to having an upstage mic of any kind, you know, is also a good litmus test. And, but right. yeah, yeah, it's good. I know, I, I know you like to talk about the, the, the pie in the sky stuff, but, I, but like, I feel like people really do get value out of the specifics that, that we share here. And I would love to get some value uh, for all of us. So any, we've talked about some of the specifics, uh, you know, that we do ask for in our contracts here. But share yours with us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. It would be good. Maybe we could even create a page on the site where we just list all of the things that anybody has come up with so that we can all be so helpful. Right. We can all look at this list and say, OK, well, I don't need that thing. But, whoa, I didn't even think about this other one. Like, that's the, the great stuff. So, yeah, feedback at Gig Gab Podcast. We'll start building that that resource for everybody. I think that'd be a good thing. That'd be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Because because that's the thing. 
that, you know, it, it makes it easier to go into those conversations with a little more confidence. Uh, if you, if, if you, if you're able to just present it as opposed to having to remember off the top of your head, those, you know, each of those things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. Fun stuff. I love getting to do this. I missed it for the last 20 days. I did enjoy having a, a schedule free day where I had like, you know, there, 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 there were some benefits, but I missed this. So I'm glad that we're back. It's good. Back. It's good. You got anything else for today, man? Nope. Got a nice full weekend of gigs ahead. Nice. And, uh, I think, you know, hearing you talk about how busy you've been and how busy I'm going to be. I have two open dates for the rest of the summer. That's it. All the way through September, I have That's two awesome. dates that I would fill. I, I think, again, I don't know if if this is an overreaction to such little music in the last couple of weeks and a lot of people are, you know, adding music. Yeah. Uh, I've got a lot of the gigs that I lost are starting to come back, which That's is kind of good, you know, yeah. good places. So, you know, we'll, we'll ride it, you know, and hopefully, uh, you know, maybe it will continue if people come out to see music. So we keep doing the best we can and be entertaining and, you know, touch people and move people. And uh, hopefully, we'll get a new renaissance in the desire for live music. It does seem like it's seems like it's different. You know, there aren't the there aren't the big cover band club dance clubs like there used to be. That that seems to be harder to do. But other types of music that other types of venues that are being creative about how they want to feature music in scaled down formats. I mean, yeah, you know, like yeah, people doing track playing a great singers coming out with tracks or harmony duos and trios or, you know, acoustic music formats. That stuff seems to be at least, you know, Northern California and Central California. There seems to be a lot, a lot of demand for that. That's good. That's good. Are you seeing, I don't realize you haven't gigged for the last three weeks, but are you seeing people wearing masks that come out to gigs? And I don't know what the, the requirements are. I would are. say it's, it's less than 20%. There, okay. You know, there's still, yeah. yeah, yeah, less than 20%. Yeah. That, it, it's sometimes, some places less than that. And remember, there's a lot of outdoor stuff. So you sure. know, the outdoor stuff is starting. It's spring here, basically. Yeah, right. And so the outdoor right. stuff is starting, so less. But when we played, when the House Rockers played an indoor gig, I'd say around 20% played, you know, wore them indoors. So. It feels like less than that here. I, like, I think, yes, it, like, at any of the gigs that we played in the last three weeks, I probably can count on one hand, the number of people total that I saw wearing masks. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious, I, you know, at the, at the gig we did yesterday or any of the gigs we've done, I guarantee you there was somebody in there that didn't know it and had COVID. Right. And so the question is, uh, you know, where are we with that? How, sure. uh, what's the, what's the implication of that? In, you know, in a grand scale, like, is this going to wind up people in the hospital or is it just going to wind up people with, you know, with effectively cold symptoms? Like, are, where it are we It seems like that? it's out of the news, doesn't it? Like, we, we're not hearing about it. We're not hearing about hospitalization. Correct. Rates. We're not hearing about, you know, all the type of stuff. So that doesn't mean that doesn't it's mean less. it's not happening. It, right. Yeah. yeah that's right. We're sick and, and so, tired of hearing about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see th how things evolve as we head into the summer you know, will, will we see a, either a, a, you know, kind of a top down push to lock things down again, or will we see people just naturally or on their own deciding, oh, we need to be more cautious, you, you know, like, right. cause we've seen both over the last two years in different waves, right. You know, we, last summer was fascinating because we saw everything open up and everybody was pushing, pushing, pushing to have everything open up, but then Delta hit and suddenly it, it, all the people that were pushing to, you know, oh, we got to stop wearing masks. We got to do this. It was like, well, we better put our mask back on. Like this is this, this is kind of serious. And uh, and like I I talked to several venues who were hesitant to drop their masks mask mandates last summer, and finally did. And then like two weeks later, everybody showed up with masks on any anyway. You know, again, and mm -hmm. it was like, oh, this is interesting. So I I mean, I hope everybody stays safe. I hope we don't you know keep. Uh, having people get sick and die and all of that stuff. But uh, t along those lines, I'm also curious to see, you know, how things just evolve. It's, it's not, it's not going to be a, a smooth path. I mean, it hasn't been a smooth path. There's no, you know, it's just how it goes kind of a rocky mm -hmm. road in and out of this. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that it, it continues to trend towards more and more people wanting to see live music and being 
comfortable going out and seeing live music, which it sure seems like it is right now. <laughs> Hope it I stays think. that way. Yeah. I, that's what I think. It feels like, you yeah. know, maybe, you know, the great pandemic ends up being a catalyst for a resurgence in live music as exactly. a response to it. And maybe, maybe the last, again, you know, the musicians certainly want their gigs back and yeah. you know, there's still plenty of musicians, but if people come out and rediscover how much they enjoy, you know, what live music does for them, maybe it will change the, the dynamics of, of uh, a supply and demand. Right. Right. Yeah. Maybe we'll see. We'll find out. Thanks for hanging out with us, folks. It's a pleasure to have you back. It's a pleasure to be back here and, uh, yeah, look forward to uh, we get to do this again next week. So let's do it. It's good stuff. Hey, uh, not only do you need to remember if you're going to be the entertainment, there's got to be something that goes along with that. What would that be, Paul? That would be to always be performing. That's it. 